Rack and Fin Radio with Tom P. WPG Talk Radio 95.5. To quote a hero when I was a youngster watching the boob tube, Wee doggies. But this time it's not in a good sense because we're looking at significant cuts coming up next year on the Summer Flounder, a.k.a. Fluke. <sighs> Stripers, boom. Scup, a.k.a. Porgies, boom. Uh, Seabass seems to be in the status quo. We'll get into that a little later in the program. Yeah, these things will be finalized or whatever. It's going to be the next next month in January, and then everything will shake out in March when all the regulations are finally out. Man, it looks like they're just tightening the noose on the recreational saltwater angler. Hey, final day of six-day firearm week, deer week, although you can hunt with a bow. Doing that, I, I just uh, just don't get that. Can I hunt with a shotgun during archery season if I have an archery license? But <laughs> that's good for uh, if I get a um, independent blog on. We'll see what's uh, going on with that. And final day of segment B of the black bear season. Bears, man, they I, we saw some this past uh, this past week in my travels. But we shall see. And just a reminder too, don't forget now it's the staggered stocking for the ringnecks and the bobwhites. Uh, Tuesday the 12th and next Saturday the 16th. These are our fave 14. The numbers are the same for both days. Numbers are the same for both days. In the central area, Kyers Mills 200, Howardville 50, Manahawkin 50, Medford 80, and Stafford Forge 160. Now, Fort Dix, special permit, is going to get 70 on the 12th and 60 on the 16th. In the southern region, Dix 130, Glassboro 100, Heiserville 50, Mad Horse 90, Millville. A lot of fields there, man. Heavy hunting pressure as well. 340, Nantuxet 110, Port Republic. I love the port. I love Port Republic, man. And Nantuxet, two of my faves. Uh, Tuckahoe 110 and Winslow 140. Now, those are the same numbers for both stocking weeks. And for the Bob Whites. On the 12th, Greenwood and Peasley each get 260. On the 16th, the Saturday, they get 400 each. A striper bite is still going strong. Another big slug of fish moving in. Now the tail end of the run, the beginning of the end is here because a lot of smaller fish, hey, you may be able to, maybe able to take one home to eat. And if you have your bonus tag, whoa, you might be able to take two home to eat. Still some uh, 40 plus inch fish around, but those, uh, those numbers are on the wane. And just a reminder too, again, you, you have to, if you want that antlered buck permit, you have until December 13th at 1159 uh, to do it. And a freshwater bite is on those stock trap that t- t- they put in. And, oh, I'm going to read that again. And for the uh, Thanksgiving week, the winter stocking, man, they are biting their heads with a tog or chewing big time. All the white leggers. White leggers seem to be the ticket for the bigger tog, at least. Anyway, coming up in our next segment, we're saying, speaking about birds, the stocking birds, what about the ducks, man? Ducks and geese. Coastal zone waterfowl season is open, but the weather has not been conducive. Joining us in our next segment, the cool Gary Bell, president of New Jersey Waterfowl, talks about some, you know, early season uh, coastal zone waterfowl tactics, if you want to call them that, with the birds, the weather. Everything is predicated on the weather, but there are still birds out there to get. So grab that cup, grab that rebel. Be right back. Rack and Fin Radio. WPG Talk Radio 95.5. Rack and Fin Radio with Tom P. WPG Talk Radio 95.5. Back this was the day after Thanksgiving, the coastal zone, second portion of the coastal zone waterfowl season open, a.k.a. duck season, Cadigese, Brant, whatever. There's some varied limits in there but i'll tell you it's been, well we had a, a few cold days what wednesday thursday friday now so going to be in the 50s this week a lot of big rain coming uh, i guess tomorrow into monday who knows what but it's been the uh, past few years especially the coastal zone that, that's we you know you like the it's only open the first portion is only a, a, a couple of days you want the later portion along the tidal marshes of new jersey all the way up there from monmouth on down to the cape and around but it's been, uh, it's, the past couple of years have been weird. I mean, warm. They, the one time, uh, Lovey Deemer and I were out, what was it, 50 degrees, 55 degrees? The ducks were hanging out wearing sunglasses, drinking pina coladas. Honest to God, it was, uh, it was crazy. Let's get a track though on, especially hunting, uh, the puddlers, the, the, you know, the dabbler ducks, mallards, black ducks, a mallard, black duck, higher, but you know, whatever. On the coastal marshes during the beginning of the second portion, because it is not, really conducive right now you can get the birds especially the divers hopefully they're going to be coming down uh later on we get s- some more sustained cold but right now you do have opportunities join us on the line first time on rack and fin radio going in our 21st year in january 
is longtime president, 20 years. Gary Bell, New Jersey Waterfowlers. Gary, uh, when I put a call into you, it was getting kind of desperate. Man, I want some ducks, but where the hell are they? <laughs> Tom, they, uh, they're pretty much all up north. Uh, the pumpers are starting to come down a little bit. Uh, I was out yesterday, and uh, they were just following, had that nice little northwest wind blowing. They started working their way down. Really, for puddlers, what we really need is a good three days of northwest wind blowing 20, 25, day and night. Mm-hmm. And that will be uh, pushing some of these birds down. So they are trickling down. You know, I call it the early birds. They come down through. The younger birds come down earlier. And uh, But uh, pretty much we need that we need that colder weather. On the coast, it really hurts when we have a lot of rain. Yeah. And birds stay inland, and they sit in all these retention ponds and all these back swamps. Uh, once it gets cold, it pushes those birds out on the coast. You know, so pretty much that's what the guys that strictly hunt the coast, that's what they wait for. So the longer the season, the better. You know, Exactly luckily right. The, luckily, the state has it. You know, we open up uh, just for like three days in the, in the beginning because it's a split. So that, that makes every, you know, everybody pretty happy. We're able to get a couple of brant. If the brand is open, you got to be careful in the brand season. It's, it's crazy what the yep. brand are like. You know, it's uh, right now. There's more brand now than we ever seen. We're only allowed one. I don't know the reason. What what the feds think? I have no idea. Uh, but other than that, that's pretty much. You know, you wait for that cold weather to come down, and uh, and we're getting we're starting to get it now. But like mm-hmm. you said, it's it's going to warm up again. You know, so. Yep. What it does, it just puts the brakes on the birds. They just hold. You know? Gary, what, uh, what primarily are we looking at now? We have mallards, black ducks. Now, we, I, the blue-winged uh, teal are probably gone. But now you mentioned that you heard uh, from one of your sources that green wings are still up way up in New York State. Right. I talked to a guy that's <laughs> up in New York. In St. Lawrence River, the, the, <laughs> the green-winged teal are still stacked, stacked on the river. You know, so. And this is, this is what's been going on for the last couple of years. It's just been a lot warmer. There's mm-hmm. no reason for a bird to fly down when it doesn't have to. You know, so. We rely on Lake Champlain, Lake George. We need some of those big lakes to freeze up. And if we don't get that, we don't usually get a lot of good birds, you know. So, you know, I've been shooting red, I've been shooting a couple of black ducks, you know, on the meadow. And mm-hmm. they, uh, they're just that dark. They're not that – they're that dirty orange foot. I'm not seeing those big, nice, big bulls, you know, orange feet yet. Yeah, all right, so, the orange legs. Yeah. So, guys, we're, no, we're looking, at, we're looking at black ducks, mallards. Yeah, what about uh, – again, they classify them as a mallard, I guess. These I'm seeing more and more of them over the years. Again, because we like to drive through Forsyth, and and we, we like to, especially in the uh, late winter, early spring, seeing a lot of the the mallard black duck hybrids. Have you, have you noticed that? I've just seen to be yeah, in increasing I, numbers. Yeah, a, l- a little bit, not not much. I don't I don't think they're really too concerned about that. Yeah, I, I've had I've had one. I've had actually I had an issue with one of the uh, one of the one of the wardens that. You know, it was you know it it was all black. It was the black duck was completely black, but the wings were were mallards. And you know, he kind of accused me of shooting two black ducks when it was very well. It, it was like if you strip it all down, you look at the wings, and they were all they were all one hundred percent mallards. You know, but there are some some guys are getting with the you know the back tail, you know the curl tail on the mallards right. on the black duck and drake so tails. I've yeah, had, you know, <laughs> yeah, I've had a couple of black ducks that had a little greenish in the heads, which sometimes the older birds you do get that color. So. But I, I haven't heard many people, you know, getting that, you know, that mix, that mixed breed in there. Mm-hmm. But, Gary, but, until, hey, until, pretty, go ahead. Go ahead. I was saying, ahead. until we get this, um, it's inevitable. Let's, and now how long will it last? Who knows? A cold snap, two days, three days, as Gary said, four days. So Gary Bell, president of New Jersey Waterfowl's topic is this, um, a second portion beginning of the, the coastal, uh, duck season, waterfowl, also Canada goose, Brent, whatever, but it's, it's not, Okay, I remember sometimes when well, we were ice fishing in mid January, in mid December, and the, right, the gunning right. here was, as we'll call it, gunning down. Shout out to the late great George Loader. George up there listening, saying, now you're going to mess this one up. We're hunting down there behind Marmore, you know, Beasley's Point back in there in the Metas. And, Gary, it was, it was balls to the wall, man. The ducks were flying in everywhere. Winds blowing, yeah. we're half frozen. A week later, we're sitting out there with 60 degrees. So you, yep. you just don't know, but it's early. It's like right now, Gary, what are we looking at? You have one day to hunt. You're out there on the meadows. Black ducks primarily, mallards. Do you have uh, anything else a- around? Pretty much on, on the salt marsh, on the marsh, you, you got your black ducks. That's your that's your 90% birds. Right. You know, and then, you know you do get some gadwalls coming through. You know, again, once that cold weather starts, you'll start seeing a little bit more variety. You know, your shovelers will start showing up. 
Uh, your pintails, some of the pintails are down here. Some guys are getting them. You know, not 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 crazy, but the marshes, the marshes, the marshes are changing, and the, uh, right. I think that it's not for the good. Uh, I noticed the tides are running a lot higher than they always did. You know, uh, some of the ramps always would you know only flood out on a, on a flooded tide or moon tide, but it seems like they're just about ready to go over the banks on an everyday occurrence now. So I'm not really sure, but that's what it looks like. You know. Uh, you know, it is yeah. rising. The bay is rising, and that's and that's a, that's affecting the uh, food source that's in the area. You know, and uh, if there's no food, there's no ducks. It's simple as that's that. As simple you as that. Food, yeah. You're going to find ducks. That's that's all there is to it. Again, know, the, so. again, the primary uh, forage for the for the puddlers. What is it? I mean, I know the I know the rail birds, for example, like the wild rice, the soars up up in the Mullica and and areas like that, in the Viding Creek. What are what's primary down here now? What are the what are they gorging on now? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. Is you know I've gotten them with the spark. You know they're filled with that spartina seed. Yep. You know which mm-hmm. is which is not a really good food base. You know when uh, I th- I just have a feeling they're going into the backwoods more. I did shoot some mallards that were on you know that I gotten on the bay and they were full of uh, acorns. So get out! Me, that's wow. Yeah. Yep. So. Now, Gary, I've also, seen I've seen that up in the north zone early season with the woodies and the mallards because we like you know back right. to hunt oh, down as as the season's progress coming down. But wow, right. I never saw that down here. And Gary mentioned the pintails uh, again. The limit's only one. It used to be one. What, yeah, the yes. populations reproduction. Over wondering something's happening here. Yeah, with that. Yeah, I don't. I I don't know. I just I don't know. They did, you know, did studies years ago, and I, it's. I don't think anybody knows, to tell you the truth. You know, I, I certainly don't know, you know, so I used to see them a lot and now you don't. Yeah. Uh, I do mention up there, the sawmill, the Meadowlands up in that area, the North Zone. Yeah. There's quite a, quite a few, quite a few pintails up there, you know, and then they move down. But when they come down, I have no idea where they go. It's you like know, the weak you. fish. When they come down the coast, they hit them. Where the hell happens to them? What happens to them? That's it. <laughs> right, where they go. Right. That's right. wild hunting up Sawmill Creek. You have the turnpike behind you. You have Manhattan ahead of you. And there's ducks beyond all get out. That, oh, yeah. That's crazy up there. That area That area can be a lot of birds in that area. At times. At times. At times. Right. Trying to go up. Yeah. It's it's hit or miss. It hit or miss. Any more. Any more. It's hit or miss. You know. Yeah. Uh, Look, I'm, I'm going to be out tomorrow. It's Friday. You know, <laughs> what am I going to expect to go find, you know, uh, tomorrow? You know, so. Yeah, listen. Or or buffies or what? Yeah, again, buffalo heads, uh, I've seen some of them. What now? You, you're talking big spreads, uh, uh, half a dozen decoys, a dozen. You're mixing them up. What's the dealio? Go. Well, for, for the divers, a lot of guys, I think, are making a lot of mistakes. I mean, anymore, they finally, some of the green head gear and some of the tangle free, they, they finally got smart. And they starting to make some hens. But years ago, when you bought a, a dozen buffies in a box, they were all drakes. There was no hens. And it, it just, I, don't, I never could understand it. I <laughs> use all hens. My, there you my, go. My, my diver rate or my puddle rate is 90% hens, you know. So, and I always, you know, it's it's pretty much, it's, Tom, it's like when, it's, it's like when you go to a bar and you're a young guy. You go. You go to a bar and you see a bunch of guys in there, one or two women. What's your chance? Get you know? the hell out. Let's find someplace. Right. <laughs> so you know what? You know, that's that's, that's around, vintage. Man, that's vintage it. Gary yeah. Bell. Vintage Gary yeah. Bell. Go, man. <laughs> so, but that that's how it is. You know, like right now is like you know for mallards. You know, this is like their their time they start mating. So you get you get a couple. You know, a single Drake, and he sees a whole bunch of Drakes in the in that in your rig. Uh, I ain't got a chance. You know, I'm right. going to get chased away. It's just human nature, you know, so. But, yeah, you know, one of my favorites, though, I, I, I would love to get one mounted because I've, I've shot at him over the years. I think I, I nailed one. It was a hen. The, um, you know, the, the, the widgeon, the bull pates, they are yeah. absolutely gorgeous. Nice. That, that's a they're, little they're later on, correct? They, they should just start coming down now. They're really stacked up in the Manasquan and the Shark River. If you really yep. just want to take pictures, you, they're really loading up on, on the shoreline right now. We yep. like a sandy, you know, sandy gravel bottom, you know. So. Mm-hmm. I had a but call from a, I had a call slowly. from a tackle shop up on the sports over the exact, the Garrett, the exact same thing. There's okay. ducks up to Wazoo yep. up here, and that's what they are probably. Yep. Yeah. Just give them time. They'll start working the way, you know, we get some great, you know, the right tides and all that, you know, like this says, puddlers, you want to shoot on a low tide and mm-hmm. guys do, you know, I noticed, I did notice, Tom, guys don't want to sit any longer than nine, 10 o'clock. They're gone. The ramps are completely empty at 10 o'clock. And I, and I do believe for the puddlers, 
they changed their changed their polar's habits. They uh, there you go. Yeah, they, they're getting they're getting harassed early in the morning. They leave. The guys leave by ten o'clock. The birds start trickling back in, and most most of my polar shooting anymore is from nine to two. Really? I very seldom get birds in the morning. I get an occasional black duck or two early in the morning on the meadow. You know. Yeah. Then after that, it goes dead for a while, and then it, it picks back up. You know. Yeah, it's fine. I noticed. I noticed, I noticed that as well. Uh, down the what's that? The Parker Town Beach. Uh, the ramp down there. Okay. Right. Seen that? Right. Yeah. Exact. Every- Mira. Exactly what you said. No. No kid. Wow. Yeah, it just they they want to just I don't know I don't know if they just want to shoot they just want to pull the trigger or or what you know and then, mm-hmm. and then they got to go home I I don't know you know I just and the way things are going now you know with, the, with things so slow you know the birds are not too really slow it's just I tell people just go out and look at the scenery you know make go yeah. to a place where you like to watch you know the scenery. And just be patient. Be patient. You will get birds. They, yeah, they, they will show up. The, the, the P, will show up. The P in my last name actually does not stand for patience. Because, Gary, I'm the, that's my lovely Dee Marie in a deer blind or duck blind. Either sit still, please, or shut yeah. up. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Gary, listen, we yeah. only have a couple of minutes left in this segment. Thanks for your input on this. But what about the New Jersey Waterfowl? Uh, tell us about the organization. I understand it's been around since, what, 70 or 71, 69, yeah, somewhere? No, yeah, not, yeah we, the guy I started in 70 and uh, it's been, you know, it's been really strong, you know, through the years, you know, membership had, had dropped. Uh, we don't know what the membership, you know, why it dropped. It was very strong when we had a, uh, when we tried to fight, you know, it went over from lead to steel. Guys were very involved with that. And a lot of guys quit on that. Yeah. But, I remember. Oh well, yeah. I was but, a kid. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, it, you know, the membership is still going. Uh, what happened is we're starting to get uh, some of the groups down in South Jersey. Some of the guys like uh, Jamie Lloyd down in that area. And there's more involvement. The duck hunters are going to be ended up. They're going to be down in South Jersey. That's kind that's of what it looks like hunting. it's coming to. Hey, you know, that's speaking of which, coming. at yes. your banquet last year, who was sitting two tables for me? But but the lovely Luann and Nick Germanio from Bell Plain Supply. All yeah, the way down yeah. there in Lower Township in the Cape, man. That was pretty cool. I hadn't seen Nick right. in years, man. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Our, our dinners are going real well. You know, uh, that, you know, a good fundraiser. And that's able to support, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're doing. You know, educational programs we do. You know, right. uh, I think the state's happy with our educational programs. You know, the do's mm-hmm. and don'ts on waterfowl. And then we do it. We are really doing real good in South Jersey. And starting up North Jersey is the Wood Duck Box Program. That, right. That's good. That's running real good. We got roughly about a hundred boxes out now, and we we're going to look to put out another hundred through the you know through you know in, in the next couple of years we can be you know going right. strong on that. So, well, Gary, how do people find out more about the New Jersey waterfowl? Do you have a Facebook uh, website yeah, page? We, what do you got? We we, we do have uh, we do have a website. It's it's up. At, we're, we just got it. So give us a little bit more time by maybe by the end of the year. It should be up and running. You know, it'd be, you know, just, you know, you'll see it, uh, New Jersey, you know, it, the Facebook. Yeah. Okay, Gary. I'm, I'm not a computer guy, but those, these guys will find it. They find hey, listen, everything else. Hey, hey, Bell, I still use dial up. <laughs> and I still uh, have a rotary phone. There you go. Now you're talking. Hey, rotary, yeah. hey yeah. people, it works. They work. Go it with it. Works. Well, it Gary, have a great remainder of the season. Best of all, we'll see all you right. at the dinner. Hopefully we'll see you on... Hopefully we'll see you at the Atlantic uh, County Game Preserve. Listeners, this man does not miss. Trust me. Yeah. He yeah. does not miss those birds. Okay, Gary, you take care, man. All right, Tom. Thanks a lot. Have a good week. See you later, bro. All right. Gary Bell, cool guy. Way long on that uh, segment. Be right back. Rack and Fin Radio. WPG Talk Radio 95.5 FM and 1450 AM. South Jersey's talk station. Fox on set. How secure are your private messages on Meadows platforms? The company's messaging app called WhatsApp has long insisted their text messaging features end-to-end encryption, but that claim has been called into question over the presence of Meta's monitoring staff being able to view messages sent through the service. Now Meta says end-to-end encryption is being rolled out on Facebook and Messenger. This will include things like editing already sent messages and having both messages and media disappear after 24 hours. It should work on both mobile apps and desktop browsers, and clearing cookies will clear records of the chats. Not every product will feature this encryption, however. Community chats in Facebook groups, for instance, won't. Neither will chats with business or professional accounts. And the company says if one party in the chat shares the chat with a third party, that new party sees everything.
With Fox on Tech, I'm Evan Brown, Fox News. Rack and Fin Radio with Tom P. WPG Talk Radio 95.5. Here we go. Look out below. You're back inside Rack and Fin Radio with me, Tom P. Week of December 9th and 10th. And that was Gary Bell, New Jersey Water Fowlers, man. Quackers. Get the quackers. I'm just old Red Skelton skit. Yeah, people remember that Red Skelton? Yeah, right. right. And I didn't realize how tall that guy was. He's about 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, he's, a, he's, a, he's a big guy. I uh, had the Gertrude and the Heathcliff thing or something. No, wait, what was the joke? What do um, what do ducks do when they fly upside down? They quack up. As a kid, I thought that was hilarious. But back to the coastal zone season. It's going to be uh, touchy here for a while till we get, as Gary said, that sustained cold snap. Three days, four days, five days. Get the freeze going on. One, I want the ducks to come down. I'm going to love that. Two, I want to get a uh, want to get some ice fishing in. It's going to have, unfortunately going to have to be up in North Jersey again, but. That's the way the situation is. Speaking of uh, fishing and what is happening on the front, last week we had on Tom Fody uh, talk about the striper situation. Now, they had the meeting this past Tuesday at the Stafford Forge uh, Municipal Building there in Manahawkin. And basically, this is what came up. Tommy had mentioned that there was going to be uh, talking about the flounder, the, the sea bass and, and the, you know, the porgies, a.k.a. scup. Shook out like this looks and again. This has to be voted on, and, and the whole business process is ongoing. But this is this is the skinny: a fourteen point five percent cut in striped bass. A and I don't understand this. Another cut in porgies, ten percent in the scup. Why? You just, why you just had him a thirty? It's a big cut in that. And then here's the death knell. This is going to really impact, really impact the shore tackle shops and ancillary businesses. A twenty eight. Proposed 28% cut in fluke, aka summer flounder. And I talked to Ty, I said, What what is going on? Is there a movement to basically wipe out inshore recreational fishing as we know it? Fody, glad to have you back on. Listen, it's extremely rare to have guests back to back on week, but this is a vital situation here. Tom, what uh what was your take? You were at the meeting, listeners. Full disclosure, I was and I was hoping to get something out of the woods. Way late, way dark, and I said, don't think I'm going to make it. Even if I drive like I'm on the Concorde, that used to be a supersonic jet. So, Tay, what uh, what was your take? You were there, packed house, I understand. What happened? Well, everybody got upset. Everybody's telling them, what are you doing? Why are you making us kill f- more fish than we need to kill to get one to take home to eat? Mm-hmm. Why are we basically putting in rules and regulations that makes no biological sense since the spawning stock biomass is bigger to produce a high young of the year. It's not. It's not protecting the females. The females. There's enough females to do the highest young of the year if the recruitment is right. But the, and it's environmental conditions which the fishermen have no control over. I mean, they're the regulators. They should be working with their states to stop global warming and, and basically clean up the Chesapeake Bay. But they just, you know, their directors and their personnel at those states have not done that. They've tried. But then they introduced uh, blue catfish into the Chesapeake Bay that gobbles everything down and must mm-hmm. eat a lot of striped bass fries. Mm-hmm. So that's why we're getting low numbers. I mean, I, you know, if I was Jewish, you and I would start sitting shiver for the recreational fishing industry on the East Coast next week to celebrate its death. Tom, I mean, that's, this you're is, not, bless his, Fody's not being melodramatic. He's been doing this. He was a, um, one of Tom's a leg- as I said before, he's a legislative chairman of New Jersey uh, State Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs and the Jersey Coast Anglers Association, and former long time, something like uh, 24 years, long time governor's appointee to the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, and served as the governor's proxy for six years. So that's 30 something years in this game, Tom. So you've seen it all. You've seen the highs, not so highs, the lows, the lower than lows. I think right now, Tom, we're, we're probably at the nadir if this stuff goes through. What do you think? I think that we basically are restricting the fisheries on both the commercial and the recreational side with data that is bad, as usual. Garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. And also, that is bigger than what you need to be to produce the highest youngs of the year. And you're just not doing it because of environmental conditions, global warming, and other factors. We have nothing to do with that. We can't control global warming. You and I personally can't do nothing. We do our best. You know, I put solar panels in, I drive a Prius and things like that. But it's up to the government to do that. And the government's failed. The same way they failed us about, you know, years ago, we've talked about this before, they were supposed to put Dr. John Borman went before the Congressional 
committee when they first put the change in the MREPS in 2008 and said, I need $50 million to run this program. And the question I asked the other night, I says, in 1981, we were spending $18 million on recreational statistics, the government. What are they spending now? I said, that's a rhetorical question. They're still spending the same $18 million. And you could buy a hell of a lot more time and energy in 2007, and yet we're spending the same pittance to try to basically Mm -hmm. um, get the figures on about 11, 12 million saltwater anglers. It's ridiculous. And Tom, I mean, it's, it just, it's, it's the it's the march, you know, and I get this thing. Well, uh, you know, I mean, like you said, for these people aren't on the boats. It's all computer modeling and things like that. And I spoke to one guy. He says, well, you know, I said, what about this and this? And they said, oh, yeah, we meant well. I said, uh, with all due respect, you never hear the term. Uh, it's a cliche because it's true that the path to hell is paved with good intentions. That's Tom, right. like you said, it's it's a mishmash of conflicting information, stocks, biomass, what have you. And it's, uh, I'm just seeing more and more, like, and, and I told, told you this last week, more and more guys, increasing numbers that we, no, nah, I'm not going to fish this year. I'm going to do something else, pickleball or something. So the angler numbers are dropping as well. People are just getting fed up. It, it's, it's hurting the potty boat industry. It's hurting the charter boat industry. It's hurting the tackle stores. It's hurting the marinas. And it's hurting the quality of life in New Jersey. You know, the, part of the quality, one of the reasons I moved to New Jersey was the fish. I was at the Fish Island Beach State Park. I could have picked a bunch of states because I was basically just graduating from college after the service. And I said, I want to go to be as close to Island Beach State Park as possible. So that's where I came. I moved to New Jersey to fish. And and to take fish home to eat, not just to fish and, and catch and release fish, but to be able to harvest fish to feed myself, feed my wife, and give it to my neighbors sometimes. I mean, and that's been taken away from us. And we barely can take enough fish to basically have a meal out of nowadays. You know, it used to be I could I could I supply my neighbors with bluefish and things like that. Or it's when you had a big catch of fluke or things like that, you spread yeah. it out. Nowadays, you don't have enough to feed yourself. And Tom, just as, as an aside, this is and I and I, I took the captain's word to heart because I've known him for many many years, decades. <clears throat> a party boat uh, up in the Shark River area. He said, Tommy P. It was great, the striper bite's great, but people are getting tired of, after a while, it wears, you know, you're paying the fee to get on, the gas to get there, you're launching a whole bit, that the uh, fish of a lifetime catcher, I agree, they were getting time, 40 to 50, sometimes they had a couple of fish over 60 inches, great photo, back in, immediately released, what have you, but that catch of a lifetime, the big fish thing gets tired when you're spending that kind of money and you want to take a fish home to eat. Yeah, I mean, and you can't. You can't. I mean, one of the guys the other night basically asked the question, you mean if I caught an 84-pound striped bass and have the world record, I can't weigh it in? And, yeah, you know, they've lost that opportunity now. we put mm-hmm. them out of being able to do something like that. So all those tackle records we have on striped bass are gone. And, you know, it's going to be happening with other species. I mean, we make decisions on what we basically do to manage fisheries, and it should be in the best interest of the of the public, it's supposed to take the economic stakeholders. We're stakeholders, right? And supposed to take the economic impact of the stakeholders. Well, you know, the same thing is this is not going to necessarily have impact, but we don't have the data to prove it. I mean, and this is what the same answer I've been getting for thirty five years. And Tom, I go back longer than that. I remember Bob Pond coming to Berkeley Striper Club in the seventies and talking about the fact that environmental conditions were causing the problems with the striped bass in the Chesapeake Bay, besides us harvesting too many fish. But you remember, back then, we were harvesting in New Jersey. We had the only regulations, and we 18, 18, 18 inches. fish, yep. 18 inches, and 10 fish. I mean, other states had 14 inches and unlimited. You could take whatever you want home. So we've cut back our harvest. We've cut back it on summer flounder. I mean, summer flounder in New Jersey was 14 inches. And down south, it was 13 inches. We're now up at 17, 18, 19 inches. Mm -hmm. And we're protecting fish that start spawning at 13 inches. It's not where they spawn at 20 inches or something. They're spawning at 13 inches. Matter of fact, when we rebuilt the the stocks on summer flounder, we only had one we call ones, twos, and threes. That's how old the fish were. So they were 13, 16, maybe 17 inches. That was it, the biggest fish. And we we brought the spawning stock biomass all the way up. You know, they refuse right. to look at They don't want to look at alternatives because they're so set in their way. 
I mean, I, as you know, I sit on MAFAC, Marine Fishery Advisory Council Committee, excuse me, to the Secretary of Commerce. And we're talking about climate resiliency. And what do we do because of climate change because it's affecting all the fisheries? And he says, we need to be thinking and we need to be have common sense management. Not telling me you can't do this because it's not in the, in the, the regulations or the laws at this time. Then we need to change the law, but it takes so long. And nobody wants to do that because they're afraid of lawsuits by the envi- environmental groups. I mean, they started the train when, they, when the environmental groups started seeing, suing National Marine Fishery Service in the 90s. They started saying, we've got to avoid lawsuits because they were losing money because they right. were never fighting them on appeal. And what happened was they basically put in regulations that are, very, very conservative. They're always on the ultra-conservative part. Well, that was fine we had when you were doing re- decent bag limits. But now you've got us down where you're killing the industry and you're just killing the fisheries. I mean, and they don't realize this. The, a lot of the people that run the fisheries no more are not the biologists that used to go out in the field and work on par- a party boats or go out and go with the commercial fishermen or basically do sampling. They're, they're, mo- they're models. They're they sit behind a computer, basically figuring yeah. out this is, should do this, this should do this, and we're in the real world. We're not in the computer world, and things in the real world don't work like the computer models they have. Tom, we, 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 I, we, we've been fishing, at you, and uh, my lovely Dee Marie says, does this look like a species that's in trouble? I mean, how many can you catch? And it's not just this one area. Tom, I might get reports from all over the place. And, uh, well, listen, the one uh, little ray of light here, from what I understand, the sea bass, Tom, stayed status quo. Yeah, and we d- were two times above the quota. Yeah, the right. <laughs> I mean, what, we can't win. I, I actually got up the other night and apologized. I said, I'm sorry for lying to you for all these years. Because I basically said years ago, if we suffer the pain, we'll reap the benefit. I rem- Fody, I remember that and said, I remember yelling at you. I remember that. Yeah. Well, this is how things turn around, huh? <laughs> yeah, and now I'm saying we suffered the pain, and we're still suffering the pain, even though we rebuilt the stocks. That's not... W- what should be happening. Of course, they're regulating as what was going on in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, but not what went on in the 80s, 90s, and, and beyond. I mean, think about this. 1986, today, December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day. Always mm-hmm. remember that day. I'm fishing lavalette. I'm fishing bluefish. The water is so cold that I'm, picking, I'm catching 15-pound bluefish and dragging them out in three minutes because they're still stunned from the coldness. And that's when I right. caught the largest striped bass that I ever caught an eight-pound test from the surf, a 46-pounder. But it's Pearl Harbor Day. Now we can go out, the water temperature is 50 degrees. It's, it's, yeah. or, or higher. Well, it's not cold anymore. Yeah, we're going to have some cold temperatures here, but this is not what it's cold. I would have ice on my lagoon nowadays by right. this point. Get my boat out. I'm, I haven't had ice on my lagoon that I had to worry about since 1988. And I, when I first moved to my house... There used to be nine inches of ice on my lagoon. No. You could walk. No. There were people who remember driving cars over Bonica Bay. Yeah, I remember that. That hasn't yeah. happened. Yeah, happen. Tom, we got to hang on. This is up against a hard break. We have Tom Foti on the line. We're going to be talking and uh, get more into the striper stuff in the next segment. Grab that cup. Grab that red. We'll be right back. Rack and Fin Radio. The WPG Talk Radio app is everything South Jersey. Local news and information updated around the clock from New Jersey's largest radio news team. Download the WPG Talk Radio app for your phone, tablet, Apple CarPlay, and Android Auto today at WPGTalkRadio.com. Powered by Smokers Haven. Smokers Haven has the finest selection of cigars. Stop in at one of their five locations and let them help you find the perfect cigar to pair with your life. SmokersHavenNJ.com Fox News, I'm Carmen Roberts. Israeli warplanes continue striking parts of Gaza, including some southern areas designated for evacuees. Israeli forces push deeper into Gaza, while Hamas launches more rockets into Israel. As the Israel-Hamas war enters its third month, the United States vetoed a U.N. resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire while urging Israel to protect Gazan civilians. Fox's Nate Foy in Israel. A Michigan judge sentences school shooter Ethan Crumbly to life in prison without parole. For the 17-year-old that victims' families called a monster for the mass shooting at Oxford High School two years ago, the killing of four classmates and injury of seven others. Fox's Jeff Manasso and demonstrations today at the UN Climate Conference in Dubai may be the most intense yet in a push for nations to take decisive action. America's listening to Fox News. 
Your WPG Atlantic City Electric Gacky Weather Forecast for South Jersey. Some patchy fog to start today, otherwise it's partly sunny and mild with a high 59. Cloudy tonight, the low 45, and then temperatures rising into the upper 50s. Tomorrow, rain and a thunderstorm mainly late in the day, otherwise cloudy and windy with a high 66. A shower to start Monday morning, otherwise a mix of clouds and sun, windy and colder, Monday's high 48. A Mackie Weather Forecaster, Rose Tamburino on WPG Talk Radio 95.5. Rack and Fin Radio with Tom P. WPG Talk Radio 95.5. You're back inside Rack and Fin Radio with me, Tom P. Week of December 9th and 10th. What kind of poison do I want? Tom Foley just said off the air when discussing the options for the striped bass regulations for the 14, 5%, wherever it's going to go. We're going to get into that in another segment somewhere, uh, when, when, whenever this stuff shakes out and we'll see what it is. Tom, what just a sense of exasperation we've told us. It doesn't seem to be happening. What do the recre, uh, recreational anglers do? What recourse do we have? How did, how does this stuff get? Um, Emirates was supposed to be a, a, a big improvement to whatever's happening. Obviously, it's not for my corner anyway. What, what's going on? What do we do? We need to stop fighting as a community. The, you know, they're trying to get the party boats and charter boats against the private boats. We can't allow that. We also have a, a bunch of people saying we're not restricted enough in the recreational community. They're getting money from environmental groups and other groups. I mean, we have these people that are, on the last hearing, not the one we had yesterday in person, because they didn't show up. But at the hearing before, they always say, no, the, the, the guy's fishing on party boats and checking everything. They're doing this. They're doing that. When it has to say that, to, speaking to these people face-to-face, you notice they didn't show up to the meeting. And they didn't say a word about it. There was none of that garbage that went on in the first virtual hearing. I mean, we have divided the community. The community has divided itself. And it used to be we all worked together. When we were working for striped bass, game fish, I had the catch and release guys. I had the subsistence fishermen. I had everybody working because what we were looking for is a better recreational experience and also to protect game fish so we at least would have fish to take home to eat. We've gotten away from that. And the organizations that fought for it, Stripers Forever and, and things like that, have, when have you heard the last time they talked about making a game fish? Whenever the Guides Association yeah. or any of those associations. We start, I start Wait, Tom, that easier. Guides Association, is that the, the organization or group that you don't have to be a guide to belong to, just send the money? Yeah, that's. <laughs> I mean, you know, when the CCA of Maryland was formed, I was invited down by. I think you know these people: Chris Wells, who wrote the book yeah. Stripers, Clay Gooch, who, who got involved in Maryland sport fishing, and Al Getz, who was on the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries and and uh, and the Mid Atlantic Council. And they came down and said, "We're starting the CCA because." We don't think the Maryland Sport Fishing Association is working hard enough on making striped bass and no-sale no fish in Maryland. So we're going to do it. I said, I'll give you all the help I get. They said, why don't you come down and be the executive director? I said, no, I'm not looking for a paid job, but we'll help you. It's now almost 40 years later, 30 years later, because that was the early 90s, and they're not talking about it no more. None of the groups are talking about it. We were, I was running up and down the coast in the ni- late 90s and early uh, 90s. Uh, basically talking about how we should make some striped bass no sale. We had all the groups up and down the up and down the um, up and down the coast doing the same thing. What happens when they didn't win it? You know, unlike New Jersey that started in '39 and it took us to 1991 to do it and kept plugging at it, we never gave up. There was always guys like Bill Feinberg at the uh, Esbury Park Fishing Club that had worked in '52 and was still working in his 80s. And just passed away a couple of years ago in his 90s, but always working for Game Fish. Mm-hmm. Those people have not done that. There's not, the Guys Association doesn't even talk about it. Matter of fact, they support the commercial fishermen. They never attack the commercial fishermen. If you listen to any of their stuff, and any of their stuff, Stripe is forever, mm-hmm. they never mm-hmm. talk about the commercial fishermen anymore. They talk about restricting the recreational catch. And so they pit each other against the other, so we're not working as a cohesion. Tom, this work. wedge being driven by uh, the catch and release and... Not taking a shot here because I like to use the fly rod on occasion. Yeah. Remember the, the 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 saltwater fly guys and the guys. The wedge being driven, and as Hutch wrote in an excellent editorial uh, a couple months ago, with this uh, redu- reduction from th- from twenty eight to uh, less than thirty eight to twenty eight to thirty one, we've won the battle, but not the war. No. So they are, and and Tom, as you wrote in that paper, which is, uh, if you can tell the people how to get it, this is Fody was dead on here. 
where you said these guys that uh, for catch and release, well, they're out there targeting stripe. Oh, no, we're not. We're fishing for bluefish. Remember yeah, you wrote that photo? You remember that? And I said, how many times have I seen it? Oh, we're weak fishing. Dude, the fluke fishing doesn't seize and doesn't open for another way. And you know what they're targeting, but catch it. No, we're targeting something else. So that wedge is, the wedge is in, it's in there, Tom. It's been driven through. And again, it's a divide and conquer mentality. Yeah, and look at it. It's 51% of the mortality on striped bass for the last couple of years now. It might be different last year because all the big catches in New Jersey, which are being put in question around because the nerfs is bad. And now they're saying, well, we were off by 30%. But look, they says it'll take us to 2026 to get it straightened out. And so we're going to suffer the consequences for the next four years. But if you look at it, those old statistics, 51% in 2020, 2021 was coming from hook and release mortality. When these people went before, the, you know, the commission and the, to basically talk about striped bass, they didn't work. You need to have seasons where you're not supposed to stripe fish for striped bass at all if you want to reduce the hook and release mortality. And they were dead set against it because, oh, that will affect my customers. I won't have my charters. There you go. Because we, I, and then because they only do catch a release, so it makes no difference when when stripers forever put in their last press release about maybe we need a moratorium. Yeah, because it doesn't affect them. They don't care right. about taking a fish. They're not subsistence fishing. And it's so much against environmental justice, which is supposed to be uh, one of the big things that this governor is basically doing about talking about, you know, righting all the wrongs that we've done for the last hundred years about the poor. You know, putting all the power plants in Newark and basically put them all the pollution where they stuff for asthma. And but they also did it with fish. And they did it to Native Americans. They stole their fish. So for the benefit of others, and now they're basically killing everybody. Now because we, we diversion of water, I mean we got a mess. I'm, I hate to say this, I'm you know I'm 76 years old, but I'm I'm not seeing the light anymore unless we really get behind working together to clean up the mess we've created, and the mess the regulators have created. And we need to start going to our congressman again. You know, Congressman Pallone, Congressman uh, all along the coast. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Andrew, Congressman Smith, and saying, we can't live with this. We need you to do something about the, what's happened to the recreational fishing community. Right, but, Tom, one thing, let me let me just say, we have to qualify, T, on the environmental groups. There's radical environmental groups, and uh, you know and some of that, that want, hunt, want, want fishing and hunting stopped. Like, no, yeah. no, no. And then you have other environmental groups. I'll, I'll throw one out there, uh, Clean Ocean Action or something, like, whatever. That They're actually working, trying to do some good. You have to differentiate because there are the radical environmental groups. And Tom, what gets my ass in here when you read who are these who are these quote unquote journalists at uh, conservation organizations, and they're they're putting them under that umbrella when they're radical environs that want to stop everything. Yeah, I mean, basically, I mean, I, I sit on the board of Clean Water Action, right. not Clean Ocean. I have clean Water Action, and they're trying to do the right thing. They're trying to get clean water. We've been trying to get the pollution out of the water. I mean, why should every river, every Lake, every stream, every body of water in New Jersey have a fish advisory because of the mercury contamination we get from Pennsylvania and Ohio with their power plants burning coal and comes over out in the form of NOx. Um, it doesn't it just we don't do what we need to do to basically protect the people. And we've that's, you know, that's one of the things Jersey Coast has been doing. Other organizations have been doing for many years. And the problem is we don't get any support anymore. I mean, as we've talked about. I mean, Jersey Coast, I'm the fifth youngest, fifth youngest board member at 76. I have three guys, four guys in their 80s and two older than me in their late 70s. We don't have a younger generation getting involved. They sit behind their computers. They don't, but when we had the computer one, they had 100 people, 100. We had, we had a good crowd on, on uh, the other day, on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. But we had 50 people. Do you, rem you remember when we were at, Ocean County College, uh, when we do the They're in Tom's <laughs> River. Mary, mother of God, man. Beyond standing room only, Fody. 550 people. People in the hallways. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we did the one in um, in Ocean Spa, Long Branch, for keeping the easy close. 900 people. When I used to do three hearings, because I was always at every hearing, that, you know, I can count on one hand about all the hearings I missed because of health or being away on striped bass over the last 35 years. I mean, I, you know, as I said, I go back a long time. I mean, I was a member of Save Our Stripers, which was in New York. Back mm -hmm. in the early 70s, I was working for striped bass game fish because I was going to Hofstra out there, and that's where I basically belong. If you want to find out what options you support and want to write a letter, 
Jersey Coast has their position on our webpage. Go to our webpage, plus you'll see my article just knocking Summer Flounder, talking about it in really depth that yeah. we can't cover all the facts here. But go to www.jcaa.org and read my article and Paul Hart Hartel's article on what Stripe is, what you should comment on. And I said, I didn't want to comment on anything. I, I didn't comment on anything. And I, just, I said, this is just poison, and we've got to pick up poison. <laughs> and it doesn't yeah. make any sense. So yeah. I'm, not, I'm, not bite, I'm not falling into this trap. I mean, the other groups have to make a choice because they got to do things like you don't want to put in <coughs> further <coughs> dividing the community. So we really need to do that. But, I mean, if you want what Jersey Coast, and Jersey Coast position is almost all the position, the same thing of ASA and other groups. We're all basically mm -hmm. on the same page. But it's, it's, it's disheartening. I mean, I, Tom, I mean, Peter a long time ago tried to sh shut us down. And it, 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 Peter, there you forget, go. They were, they were showing up. They've been quiet for the last couple of years. But remember when they used to show up and boycott the Dick Weber tournament down in No, Cape I remember Maine? the Bassmaster Classic in Pittsburgh. And it's were out there holding up signs. Whatever. They, had a, they had a billboard, a dog with a hook in its lip. Right. And I went up, and I went up today, and my boss, the great Dick Wood, said, leave him alone. I said, Dick, I can't leave this. Leave this alone or you're fired. Okay. <laughs> so I went up to the loan. Yeah. I mean, went down at the mall. This yeah. is many years ago when ASA was running the uh, National Fishing Day. And we used to bring 550 inner city kids to fish on one of the uh, ponds in the mall. And we stock it with fish, and the kids were there. Peter shows up, and they push a young lady in a, in a mermaid suit. In a mermaid suit. Uh, <laughs> onto, the, onto the thing. And they have a guy w walking around with uh, dressed as a dolphin, holding us, the boat holding signs. Fish hooks hurt. And we're sitting there looking at it, and, and the park police come over. So we get, pull her out of the lake, and I says, I says, nah, leave it there. The kids will use them as target practice. They're the inner city kids. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, Tom, I, I remember those days. In fact, I remember that mermaid. She was a looker, man. Yes, yeah. me. But that, that's some of, that's some of my younger, uh, younger, crazier days. Well, Tom, thanks for joining us on Rock Minute. So, tell you, this is all going to shake out when meetings, what, next month, March? When are the New Jersey fishing game? When are the whatever's going to be decided, be decided between the 28% uh, reduction in fluke, the, the cutting porgies, the stripers. When is this going to be? March? No, the, the, the fluke will be decided next week. I'll be at the meeting. I'm going to go to Philadelphia okay. on my own dime and just to see what the hell's going on. So I'll be at Philadelphia next Tuesday and Wednesday. Some of uh, striped bass will be decided in January at the Atlantic States yeah. Marine Fisheries Commission. I'll leave you with this parting quote. Get involved. You need, and not just behind your computer. You need to start joining groups. If not Jersey Coast, pick some other club to belong to. But get involved if you want to be. You want to protect this fishery for your kids and the next generation. That's it. It's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's a perverse pleasure, a macabre pleasure that these groups event and 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 you got some recreational fish, for lack of a better term, recreational fishing groups again, divide and conquer that are all for you know. Just, just stopping fish at you know, subsistence fishing, keeping a fish to eat. My God, what a, what a what a travesty it is! Oh, it's cutting into your fifteen hundred dollar a day guide service. Yeah. Don't get me going, Fody. Okay, take okay. you take you Bye. take care, man. We'll see you soon. Best to Linda. Yeah, I had to throw that in there. Just uh, maybe not fifteen hundred, but just uh, you know. Anyway, up against the break. Be right back. Rag and Fin Radio. WPG Talk Radio 95.5 FM and 1450 AM. South Jersey's talk station. Spoiled supermarket. Rack and Fin Radio with Tom P. WPG Talk Radio 95.5. That'll do it for this week on a Rack and Fin Radio with me, Tom P. Deer season continues. Uh, segment B, bear season continues. Waterfowl season, coastal zone, and, and all over the state continues. And that was uh, Tom Foley talking about the, the cuts that are inevitable. Coming down the line, especially with striped bass. So let's get a quick fishery report with the main man, the one, the only, the famous and infamous Captain Dave the Rave Shoal. Seekin Bay Sports and Center, 81 Natalie Terrace in Seekin, where sugar rules the lot. How you doing, Dave? Doing great. Um, hey, doing let me tell you great, something, yeah. man. She, that, she didn't stop barking at me from the get-go. What's up with that? She, like you said, she, she's she a good judge knows. of character. She's, she's, got, she's got those dog senses. You know, they go back to wolf <laughs> senses, even though she's more the size of a, <laughs> of a can of beans. But <laughs> Hey, what's happening on the bass? What are, you, what are you seeing? What are you seeing? Well, like like we just heard from Tom, unfortunately, you better catch them while you're allowed. Uh, yeah. But they're, they're out here, uh, and, and the weather's been... 
okay. It's it's you know it is December, and I'll tell you what this this the the years catch up with you pretty quick. I I did go out last Monday. We we dropped some dropped some spot on the on the three mile line, and uh, I got I got a nice thirty seven incher that I kissed goodbye to, and mm-hmm. and then I had uh, my my help in here, Billy had a, had a couple more hookups that. I don't know. They just pulled the hook. Those circle hooks are supposed to stay stuck when they're stuck, but they didn't. <laughs> but in any case, yeah, it, it be, beats me up a little much. I don't know. I'm, I may I may have seen my last day unless something's really good and really close. But yeah, Dale, I'm hearing more fish uh, moving down. I had a big slug of fish move into Raritan Bay, uh, coming down Long Branch, Monmouth Beach. Oh, they should be here pretty soon. But that may uh, be it for the rest. Listen, don't forget the Back Bay area. So they they close what December 31st at midnight. Correct, Dave. The, yeah, the back, the any, back anything is closed. Inside, anything inside of the, um, you know, the, the co-regs line, yeah, you know, right at, at the all the inlets, that's all closed. Yeah. To January first, we got, yeah, you know, they do. They have been catching them outside the last couple of years. The temperature's not bad. You yep. just, you just. The, the, my problem is you can't fish. Yeah, you, know, you can't fish a twenty foot boat out in the ocean comfortable this time of year. Exactly. But you, right, can't, yeah. but you can't fish a thirty footer in. In the bay. <laughs> inside the bay and i and i get more days fishing in the bay and we catch a lot of fish yep. overall and i will definitely be back in march going after them yeah well dave now i know you have a, a good tog business there what's happening with the blackfish well they're believe it or not they're still they're still picking on the jetties yeah. it's definitely starting to yep. slow down but but the boaters are yeah they're having a field they're day they're them man <laughs> yeah the, yeah the weather the weather's tough this time of year but yeah you're gonna yep. get I know every every year. Well, I I got I got the tanks here and I got the crabs, so I see I see a lot of a lot of tog fishermen in here. So yeah, that's um, it. Dave. And it's you got it. It's going to be good out outside as as long as you can stand it. And but that yeah, it's been a fantastic fall for tog and the amount of small yep. ones that they're throwing back. And I hope most of them are getting thrown back. I know. I know there's well we won't won't, yeah. won't, won't mention any <laughs> way shape or form but there are people that don't put them all back that are supposed yeah. to and I hope you know the nature of the I, beast I know, our, I know our conservation officers officers do them, do them, do their best to keep them honest but but yeah I, I know it happens Okay cap listen we'll uh, we'll see you guys pretty soon man you take care Okay, I'll be around. All looks like I'll be here most of the winter. I might might try to get warm for a couple of days, but I I'll be keeping things going around here. We'll be when these perch really turn on. We'll be here, and hopefully oh, yeah. the bloodworm guy will be bringing them out too. Because it'll, it'll, it'll been hard to find the last couple of years. It'll be here before you know it, man. Take care, brother. Okay, we'll, we'll be talking to you. Captain Dave, man, he is great. Okay, see you next week. Rack of Radio. God bless America. God bless our troops. God bless our first responders and law enforcement. Get out and enjoy, man. Uh, some funky weather, but the uh, the stripes are still here. Fresh water is still uh, strong. Hey, man, those, those trout that they put in some of the waters of the, the ponds in the, for the winter trout cycling back Thanksgiving week, man, they are banging away. See you next week, Rack and Fin Radio.